The sixth Tuesday, we talk about emotions. I walked past the mountain laurels in the Japanese maple, up the blue stone steps of Maury's house. The white rain gutter hung like a lid over the doorway. I rang the bell and was greeted not by Connie, but by Maury's wife, Charlotte, a beautiful gray-haired woman who spoke in a lilting voice. She was not often at home when I came by. She continued working at MIT, as Maury wished, and I was surprised this morning to see her. Maury's having a bit of a hard time today, she said. She stared over my shoulder for a moment, then moved toward the kitchen. I'm sorry, I said. No, no, he'll be happy to see you, she said quickly. I'm sure. She stopped in the middle of the sentence, turning her head slightly, listening for something. Then she continued. I'm sure he'll feel better when he knows you're here. I lifted up the bags from the market. My normal food supply, I said jokingly, and she seemed to smile and fret at the same time. There's already so much food. He hasn't eaten any from last time. This took me by surprise. He hasn't eaten any? I asked. She opened the refrigerator and I saw familiar containers of chicken salad, vermicelli, vegetables, stuffed squash, all things I had brought for Maury. She opened the freezer and there was even more. Maury can't eat most of this food. It's too hard for him to swallow. He has to eat soft things and liquid drinks now. But he never said anything, I said. Charlotte smiled. He doesn't want to hurt your feelings. It wouldn't have hurt my feelings. I just wanted to help in some way. I mean, I just wanted to bring him something. You are bringing him something. He looks forward to your visits. He talks about having to do this project with you, how he has to concentrate and put the time aside. I think it's giving him a good sense of purpose. Again, she gave that far away look, the tuning in something from somewhere else. I knew Maury's nights were becoming difficult, that he didn't sleep through them, and that meant Charlotte often did not sleep through them either. Sometimes Maury would lie awake, coughing for hours. It would take that long to get the phlegm from his throat. There were healthcare workers now staying through the night and all those visitors during the day, former students, fellow professors, meditation teachers, tramping in and out of the house. On some days, Maury had a half a dozen visitors and they were often there when Charlotte returned from work. She handled it with patience, even though all these outsiders were soaking up her precious minutes with Maury. A sense of purpose, she continued. Yes, that's good, you know. I hope so, I said. I helped put the new food inside the refrigerator. The kitchen counter had all kinds of notes, messages, information, medical instructions. The table held more, more pill bottles than ever. Celestone for his asthma, Ativan to help him sleep, naproxen for infections, along with a powdered milk mix and laxatives. From down the hall, we heard the sound of a door open. Maybe he's available now. Let me go check. Charlotte glanced again at my food, and I felt suddenly ashamed. All these reminders of things Maury would never enjoy. The small horrors of his illness were growing, and when I finally sat down with Maury, he was coughing more than usual, a dry, dusty cough that shook his chest and made his head jerk forward. After one violent surge, he stopped, closed his eyes, and took a breath. I sat quietly because I thought he was recovering from his exertion. Is the tape on? He said suddenly, his eyes still closed. Yes, yes, I, I quickly said, pressing down the play and record buttons. What I'm doing now, he continued, his eyes still closed, is detaching myself from the experience. Detaching yourself? Yes, detaching myself. And this is important, not just for someone like me who is dying, but for someone like you who is perfectly healthy. Learn to detach. He opened his eyes. He exhaled. You know what the Buddhists say? Don't cling to things because everything is impermanent. But wait, I said, aren't you always talking about experiencing life? All the good emotions, all the bad ones? Yes. Well, how can you do that if you're detached? Ah, you're thinking, Mitch. But detachment doesn't mean you don't let the experience penetrate you. On the contrary, you let it penetrate you fully. That's how you are able to leave it. I'm lost. Take any emotion, love for a woman, or grief for a loved one. Or what I'm going through, fear and pain from a deadly illness. If you hold back on the emotions, if you don't allow yourself to go all the way through them, you can never get to be detached. You're too busy being afraid. You're afraid of the pain. You're afraid of the grief. You're afraid of the vulnerability that loving entails. But by throwing yourself into these emotions, by allowing yourself to dive in all the way, over your head even, you experience them fully and completely. You know what pain is. You know what love is. You know what grief is. And only then can you say, all right, I have experienced that emotion. I recognize that emotion. Now I need to detach from that emotion for a moment. Maury stopped and looked me over, perhaps to make sure I was getting this right. 
I know you think this is just about dying, he said, but it's like I keep telling you, when you learn how to die, you learn how to live. Maury talked about his most fearful moments, when he felt his chest locked in heaving surges, or when he wasn't sure where his next breath would come from. These were horrifying times, he said, and his first emotions were horror, fear, anxiety. But once he recognized the feel of those emotions, their texture, their moisture, the shiver down the back, the quick flash of heat that comes your that crosses your brain, then he was able to say, okay, this is fear. Step away from it. Step away. I thought about how often this was needed in everyday life, how we feel lonely, sometimes to the point of tears, but we don't let those tears come because we are not supposed to cry or how we feel a surge of love for a partner, but we don't say anything because we're frozen with the fear of what those words might do to the relationship. Maury's approach was exactly the opposite. Turn on the faucet, wash yourself with the emotion. It won't hurt you, it will only help. If you let the fear inside, if you pull it on like a familiar shirt, then you can say to yourself, all right, it's just fear. I don't have to let it control me. I see it for what it is. Same for loneliness, you let go. Let the tears flow, feel it completely, but eventually be able to say, all right, that was my moment with loneliness. I'm not afraid of feeling lonely, but now I'm going to put that loneliness aside and know that there are other emotions in the world and I'm going to experience them as well. Detach, Maury said again. He closed his eyes, then coughed. Then he coughed again. Then he coughed again more loudly. Suddenly, he was half choking, the congestion in his lungs seemingly teasing him, jumping halfway up, then dropping back down, stealing his breath. He was gagging, then hacking violently, and he shook his hands in front of him. With his eyes closed, shaking his hands, he appeared almost possessed, and I felt my forehead break into a sweat. I instinctively pulled him forward and slapped the back of his shoulders, and he pushed a tissue to his mouth and spit out a wad of phlegm. The coughing stopped, and Maury dropped back in, into the foam pillows and sucked in air. You okay? You all right? I said, trying to hide my fear. I'm okay, Maury whispered, raising a shaky finger. Just wait a minute. We sat there quietly until his breathing returned to normal. I felt the perspiration on my scalp. He asked me to close the window. The breeze was making him cold. I didn't mention that it was 80 degrees outside. Finally, in a whisper, he said, I know how I want to die. I waited in silence. I want to die serenely, peacefully, not like what just happened. And this is where detachment comes in. If I die in the middle of a coughing spell like I just had, I need to be able to detach from the horror. I need to say, this is my moment. I don't wanna leave the world in a state of fright. I want to know what's happening, accept it, get to a peaceful place and let go. Do you understand? I nodded. Don't let go yet, I added quickly. Maury forced a smile. No, not yet. We still have work to do. Do you believe in reincarnation? I ask. Perhaps. What would you come back as? If I had my choice? A gazelle. A gazelle? Yes. So graceful. So fast. A gazelle? Maury smiles at me. You think that's strange? I study his shrunken frame, the loose clothes, the socks wrapped feet that's, that rest stiffly on foam rubber cushions, unable to move, like a prisoner in leg irons. I picture a gazelle racing across the desert. No, I say, I don't think that's strange at all. The Professor, part two. The Maury I knew, the Maury so many others knew, would not have been the man he was without the years he spent working at a mental hospital just outside Washington, D.C., a place with the deceptively peaceful name of Chestnut Lodge. It was one of Maury's first jobs after plowing through a master's degree and a PhD from the University of Chicago. Having rejected medicine, law, and business, Maury had decided the research world would be a place where he could contribute without exploiting others. Maury was given a grant to observe mental patients and record their treatments. While the idea seems common today, it was groundbreaking in the early 50s. Maury saw patients who would scream all day, patients who would cry all night, patients soiling their underwear, patients refusing to eat, having to be held down, medicated, fed intravenously. One of the patients, a middle-aged woman, came out of her room every day and lay face down on the tile floor, stayed there for hours as doctors and nurses stepped around her. Maury watched in horror. He took notes, which is what he was there to do. Every day she did the same thing, came out in the morning, lay on the floor, stayed there until the evening, talking to no one, ignored by everyone. 
It saddened Maury. He began to sit on the floor with her, even lay down alongside her, trying to draw her out of her misery. Eventually, he got her to sit up and even return to her room. What she mostly wanted, he learned, was the same thing many people wanted, someone to notice she was there. Maury worked at Chestnut Lodge for five years. Although it wasn't encouraged, he befriended some of the patients, including a woman who joked with him about how lucky she was to be there, because my husband is so rich, he, so he can afford it. Can you imagine if I had to be in one of those cheap mental hospitals? Another woman, who would spit at everyone else, took to Maury and called him her friend. They talked each day, and the staff was at least encouraged that someone had gotten through to her. But one day, she ran away, and Maury was asked to help bring her back. They tracked her down in a nearby store, hiding in the back, and when Maury went in, she burned an angry look at him. So you're one of them too, she snarled. One of who? My jailers. Maury observed that most of the patients there had been rejected and ignored in their lives, made to feel that they didn't exist. They also missed compassion, something the staff ran out of quickly. And many of these patients were well off from rich families, so their wealth did not buy them happiness or contentment. It was a lesson he never forgot. I used to tease Maury that he was stuck in the 60s. He would answer that the 60s weren't so bad compared to the times we lived in now. He came to Brandis after he worked in, after his work in the mental health field, just before the 60s began. Within a few years, the campus became a hotbed for cultural revolution, drugs, sex, race, Vietnam protests. Abby Hoffman attended Brandis, so did Jerry Rubin and Angela Davis. Maury had many of the radical students in his classes. That was partly because instead of simply teaching, the sociology faculty got involved. It was fiercely anti-war, for example. When the professors learned that students who did not maintain a certain grade point average could lose their de deferments and be drafted, they decided not to give any grades. When the administration said, if you don't give these students grades, they will all fail, Maury had a solution. Let's give them all A's. And they did. Just as the 60s opened up the campus, it also opened up the staff in Maury's department. From the jeans and sandals they now wore when working so to their view of the classroom as a living, breathing place. They chose discussions over lectures, experience over theory. They sent students to the Deep South for civil rights projects and to the inner city for field work. They went to Washington for protest marches, and Maury often rode the buses with his students. A on one trip, he watched with gentle amusement as a woman in flowing skirts and love beads put flowers in soldiers' guns then sat on the lawn, holding hands, trying to levitate the Pentagon. They didn't move it, he later recalled, but it was a nice try. One time, a group of Black students took over Ford Hall on the Brandis campus, draping it in a banner that read Malcolm X University. Ford Hall had chemistry labs, and some administration officials worried that these radicals were making bombs in the basement. Maury knew better. He saw right to the core of the problem, which was human beings wanting to feel that they mattered. The standoff lasted for weeks, and it might have gone on even longer if Maury hadn't been walking by the building when one of the protesters recognized him as a favorite teacher and yelled for him to come in through the window. An hour later, Maury crawled out through the window with a list of what the protesters wanted. He took the list to the university president, and the situation was diffused. Maury always made good peace. At Brandis, he taught classes about social psychology, mental illness, and health, group process. They were light on what you'd now call career skills and heavy on personal development. And because of this, business and law students today might look at Maury as foolishly naive about his contributions. How much money did his students go on to make? How many big time cases did they win? Then again, how many business or law students ever visit their old professors once they leave? Maury's students did that all the time. And in his final months, they came back to him. Hundreds of them from Boston, New York, California, London, and Switzerland, from corporate offices and inner city school programs. They called, they wrote, they drove hundreds of miles for a visit, a word, a smile. I've never had another teacher like you, they all said. As my visits with Maury go on, I begin to read about death, how different cultures view the final passage. There is a tribe in the North American Arctic, for example, who believe that all things on earth have a soul that exists in a miniature form of the body that, it hold, that holds it, so that a deer has a tiny deer inside it, and a man has a tiny man inside him. When the large being dies, that tiny form lives on. It can slide into something, something being born nearby, or it can go to a temporary resting place in the sky, in the belly of a great feminine spirit, where it waits until the moon can send it back to earth. 
Sometimes, they say, the moon is so busy with the new souls of the world that it disappears from the sky. That is why we have moonless nights. But in the end, the moon always returns, as do we all. That is what they believe.